Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our second day of Solar Decathlon in the Education Division. We'll give people just a couple more, one or two more minutes here to get connected to audio and get connected to the system. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. I think we have about everybody that's going to join us at this time. So, once again, welcome back to day two of the 2023 Design Challenge. Uh, this is the Education Division presentations. Um, as a reminder, we'll have a similar format of presentations today. Each school will have eight minutes to present and then a five minute round of Q&A after the presentations. Um, at the end of the day today, we will have a separate Zoom link for you to join on to and we will do finalist announcements. So please join us at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time to join for those finalist announcements. Uh, please stay on mute with the video off unless you're presenting or a division juror and use the chat box for any technical assistance. My name is Sam Petty. I'm with the Department of Energy Building Technologies Office. I'm a technology manager for the Efficient and Healthy Schools program. I'm joined today by Demetra Biddle who is with uh, our National Renewable Energy Laboratory. We are also joined today by our two jurors, Catherine Tinkler and Patricia Joseph. Um, Catherine is a strategic consultant on planning strategies and analytics team of Page Sutherland Page, where she uses her 20 plus years of facilities and project management experience into developing capital improvement and strategic facility master plans. An experienced senior project manager, Catherine combines her experience as an existing building commissioning professional with her knowledge of operations, maintenance management to help organizations assess and evaluate their existing facilities, promote proactive maintenance strategies, and craft replacement plans to ensure long-term ROI. She has also served as a PK, as a pre-K through 12 administrator and certified classroom teacher, keeping her current teaching credential while staying in tune with how facility quality impacts indoor environmental quality and student learning. She blends this expertise to advance client initiatives, whether it is reviewing existing data, formulating data collection instruments, conducting assessments on site, or synthesizing findings into actionable project plans. Thank you again, Catherine, for joining us today as a juror. We're also joined by Patricia Joseph. Patricia is a Associate Project Architect at the ABO Group. Leading their business development, she is motivated and excited about the role of building materials and their effect on societal constructs and the environments in which we live. With 10 years of experience in the industry, she has contributed to her community through her work with educational buildings involving unique design processes throughout Colorado. She is a founding member and president of the National Organization of Minority Architects Colorado Chapter. Noma, Colorado, and is a lecturer for the College of Architecture and Planning in their undergraduate and graduate level programs. Thank you again, Patricia, for joining us as a juror today. So our first uh, presenters today are Myeongji University, and I just wanted to say we did flash our sponsors there real quick, so thank you to all of our sponsors, but uh, let's go ahead and get started with our first presenters of the day. Uh, if you guys are ready, please uh, bring up your slides. Yeah, and we'll nice to meet the timer. you. Thank you, it's good to meet you all as well. Yeah. And you all can take a few minutes to prepare your slides and get ready to go. We have about five minutes before we start. Uh, okay, thank you for saying that. Guys, can you see these slides? We can. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think we are ready. Okay, I'm um, Catherine, Patricia, are you ready? Mm -hmm. A thumbs up from them. So uh, we will be. So your teams know we will be flashing a slide background that says two minutes remaining and then a times up slide background on our on Demetra's slide like that. So um, 
uh, watch for that. Yep. Okay. We are good to go then. So, Myeongji University, please proceed. Okay, let's get started. Cherry. Hey. Hello, we are the team from Myeongji University in South Korea proposing an educational hub center, the Dream Tree Project. By 2035, Korea's current population is expected to decrease by 39% compared to 2008, and the number of closed schools have been increasing. We also need educational support for abandoned groups, such as students with borderline personality disorder and anxiety disorder. 1% and 40% of students with a specific learning disability in South Korea and the USA both suffer from symptoms of anxiety, fear, anger, and depression. This project aims their social, environmental, and educational improvements. So our team emphasizes three elements of space, users, and environments in our project of three trees for the restoration of abandoned values. The target site is the Yeonggang Elementary School, which is the first closed school in Seoul, the capital of South Korea, located near the Han River. Site analysis shows accessibility, walkability, and surrounding context of the site. The key concept of the Madang as a transitional open space is designed to link to the existing buildings and serve as an educational, social, environmental, and integrative space for BPD or AD students. Three main Madang zones are positioned by uniquely connecting to educational, environmental, and community programs. From the south entrance in Madang zone three, a first continuous circulation to Madang zone one to two, through the second level open deck area. The ramp is multifunctional as a vertical space, not only to link the diverse learning spaces, but also to socially and environmentally interact with people and nature. The roof garden as the outdoor space allows students activities such as gardening, playing, interacting, and learning to relieve symptoms of BPD or AD students. The major passive strategies are ETFD for daylighting, biosphere for water recycling, double screen massage for indoor environmental quality, CSIP for high insulation, and PCMs for heat storage. The multi story type DSF is applied to the Flex Learning Center in Manhattan 1 for visually, thermally, and acoustically comfortable learning environments. The Eco Learning Center in Madang Zone 2 is passively operated by the kinetic ergo facade. Depending on the seasonal diversity of Korea, it will perform for a well daylit lit, naturally ventilated, noise free space. Composite structural insulation panel wall system target R38 with water resistance, durability, lightweight, and easy construction for high performing insulation and air tightness. The bundled light timber structures with uracent fillings can coordinate with continuous insulation for zero thermal bridges and phase change materials called PCMs for form a layer below the zinc roof for R57. Integrated active systems are comprised of BIPVs, thermal systems, energy storage systems, piping, and lighting for a plus energy learning facility. Electricity and heat energy produced from BIPVs and PVTs on spacious roof area are designed to feed heating, cooling, ventilation, lighting, hot water, and appliance energy demands. Dedicated outdoor air system, energy recovery ventilator, and smart ventilation system also contribute to indoor air quality controls with natural ventilation coping with the post-COVID-19 era. The Flex Learning Center vertical atrium in Madang Zone 1 allows diffuse daylighting, exhaust polluted indoor air, and reduces noise transmission to improve indoor environmental quality. Indoor data from the Information Communication Technology based sensing units and energy data from building energy monitoring systems provide building users with real time indoor environmental information and energy use information through Dream Trees visualization. Roof and rain gardens in each Madang zone 
work for rainwater recycling, and are also used for experiential learning spaces about energy, water, and environments. The bonded lightweight timber structures are physically comparable to heavy timber structures. Six inch by six inch lightweight timbers are glued and bolted for rigid heavy columns and beams. Structurally, it is effective in buckling prevention by increased cross section area. Structure stability by lightweight wood structure and shading effect by extending its length. Upside construction is effective in construction cost reduction and building performance improvement by the process of EIM designing, fabricating, manufacturing, and assembly. It can not only reduce construction duration and waste materials, but also improve thermal reach and air tightness for high performing building envelopes. The Korean government wants to have zero CO2 emissions by 2015. So we wanted to use domestic wood to achieve a 29% CO2 reduction compared to general construction, plus an 18% CO2 reduction using recycled waste wood. This reduces a total of 1,300 tons of CO2 emission. Our team targets source EUI of 47 kBTU per square feet and site EUI of 22 kBTU per square feet by the integrations of design, passive, active, and cutting edge technologies aforementioned mentioned already. In addition, our building produces energy from thermal systems and PV modules to reach an energy balance. Our team roughly estimated the construction cost from schematic Korean timber construction flowchart. The construction cost per square feet is estimated to be about $420 to $500. About 85% of the construction cost will be consumed in the pre-con stage and construction and in installation stage and commissioning and monitoring stage. The construction cost we are targeting is expected to be about 17% to as much as 30% higher than normal types. However, it has significant energy saving and eco-friendly benefits, which has advantage in terms of building operation and maintenance. 12 students with one faculty and external partner work hard to realize BPD or AD student dreams through the project of Dream Trees. We hope our dream will, will come true with Dream Trees. Thank you for listening. Excellent. Thank you for the presentation today. Uh, so we're going to step into our Q&A period here. We have five minutes for questions and answers uh, with our jurors. So uh, Catherine, um, you're first on my list. So we're going to start with you. Perfect. Thank you. Um, could you go back to the floor plan of one of the classrooms? Yeah. Um, there, was, there was one where it was zoomed in and it looked like you had classrooms of just six students. Is that, what is your, what is your targeted student to teacher ratio inside of your classrooms? Well, we have actually uh, uh, 10 students per classes. Yeah, and two teachers are uh, teach them. Okay, um, talk to me about the security of the spaces. I um, I saw some of these where it had kinetic windows, um, and so is that are those windows in the classrooms themselves, and is there any type of of concern for security? Uh, okay, I, I will say that. Uh, actually, we have two gates for this uh, this building. First, main entrance is the bottom side, as you can see. Mm -hmm. Th yeah, this entrance is for everybody. And uh, upper side, we have also gate for only students. And uh, since most so of the, our yeah on yeah. the side is that is that um, blocked or screened or how do you um, how do you create it where you have access or that's 
Others can't access student areas from the exterior. Um, we have a vertical router that can rotate inside the double skin facade. Um, it is useful when there is um, heat or subs, but also helps lights and heat environments. Additionally, helps in learning, well-being, comfort, health, and also uh, private and semi-publics. Okay, great. Patricia, I had one more, but I'm, go ahead, please. Yeah. Okay. So one of my questions, um, I'm curious about, mm -hmm. it was really nice to learn about Mandang, but I'm curious about um, the views and how else um, you have created those links between the three, right? Or it's three zones, but I think it's a couple of them. So can you talk about what happens if it rains or what's the plan if, um, kind of in the same line as Catherine wrote on security, but what does that look like? Is there a way to get to all three buildings without uh, going outside? Mm -hmm. uh, we have, as. <laughs> We have three zones. First, uh, in the red line, there is uh, educational uh, Madang John, which is only students can, you know, can go there for uh, study or everything else. And green green line, there is you know, uh, environment Madang John, and the blue line is for you know social Madang is open to public. I can say that more. Um, there are three madang and um, madang zone one is the educational pro programs and this madang connect the existing building with the new addition buildings and it combines the educational programs like dream plaza and students classrooms and madang zone two like Green, green zone is eco-friendly madang, so it is naturally linked to madang zone one. And BPD AD students can enjoy social environmental programs in eco center. And last, the blue one is the madang zone three, is the most social space, and that helps students improve their symptoms through natural communication with neighbors. Okay, thank you. Uh, to add a little bit more, uh, since most of our project spaces are open, we can prevent crime to some extent with each mm -hmm. other's eyes. And for the mm -hmm. blind spots, we will solve through using CCTV or LED lighting. Okay. I am curious about um, the large st learning steps or the large stairs that you have in a lot of the images. For example, the main entrance, how does someone um, in a wheelchair um, experienced that and maybe you talked about it mm -hmm. but I'm curious about what that experience looks like uh, we, unfortunately we are at time oh <laughs> uh, can I can I answer uh, shortly uh, we are we are at time and we got to keep it fair uh, for the other teams as well okay. so um, thank you for your presentation today I we really appreciate this uh, if you don't mind everybody sticking around for one second here and pulling down your slides and then everybody that's on the line, if you wouldn't mind coming on to camera so we can, uh, I want to take a screenshot real quick and for our social media to show everybody in attendance, if you don't mind. Do you mind uh, taking your slides down, please, or stop sharing your screen? Uh, so, so. University. Thank you. And then everybody that's on, on the call, if you can come online real quick to the camera. Come on your camera. Not just uh, from the first team, but everybody attending. Yeah, everybody that's in the call at the moment, if you don't mind. All teams. Thank you. One second here. Perfect. Thank you, everyone. I really appreciate that. Um, once again, thank you, Mianji University, for presenting today. We excellent presentation. And our next university will be University of North Texas. 
team can either come back on camera or stay on camera and bring your slides up and we'll start the uh, AV check real quick. Excellent. We can see your slides. And can we hear you? Um, sound check. Sound Perfect. check. Great. And Patricia and Catherine, are you two ready to start the next round? Okay. So, University of North Texas, please take it away. All right. Good morning, everyone. We're the Eagle's Nest, and we are thrilled to present our innovative educational building design for schools and refugee camps. Here is our amazing team from the University of North Texas and Al Hussein Tech University. These are our industry partners and collaborators. Our vision statement focuses on security, empowerment, and opportunity. Introducing three refugee camps, Al Zadari in Jordan, Cox Bazar in Bangladesh, the largest in the world, and Pugnidio in Ethiopia, housing more than 80,000, 900,000, and 50,000 refugees, respectively, who have all fled from violence in their home countries. While basic facilities exist within these camps, the challenges they face, including limited access to healthcare, clean water, sanitation, overcrowding, extreme weather, and lack of self-sufficiency opportunities, highlight the pressing need for concerted efforts to support the refugees and address their critical needs. The kids in these camps have the same wants and unfortunately have the same obstacles. With roughly half of the refugee population being children, our target population is the primary school age from five to 10 years old. Al Zatari camp is in the northernmost part of Jordan, close to the Syrian border in a flat area. Moving on to the Cox Bazaar in Bangladesh, this camp is spread over a vast area with uneven terrain and has its own economy with shops, restaurants, and other businesses operating within the camp. Lastly, the Pugnito camp, located in the Gambala region of Ethiopia near the border of South Sudan, is situated in a hilly area. The refugees are building and decorating to reflect their heritage and gain a sense of belonging to the camp. These are the number of days per month that the schools will be active. The operation hours are from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. with a two-shift schedule that will follow the same school schedules that are currently being implemented by each country. A general climate analysis was conducted to determine the yearly temperature, rainfall, and wind data for each site. This helped us determine the appropriate renewables to incorporate. Appropriate building orientation as well as optimal solar PV placement was determined by utilizing sun path analysis. The schools will comply by basic UNHCR regulations and standards. The pillars of our design are safety, opportunity, and empowerment of the kids, as well as the community to provide both educational and community needs. What we're doing is not just designing a school, but rather creating an overall community system with the ability for adaptation based on each location's special requirements. We have studied the community's needs and then classified the spaces into three categories, ease of access, main secure spaces, and supporting spaces, establishing meaningful relationships between them. Taking inspiration from, from the previous slide, we began by designing the building's shape and dividing it into its core component, including a secure outdoor recreational area surrounded by other spaces. We then contained each space within a hexagonal module for added security and structural stability. As we further developed the design, we integrated passive and active strategies to achieve our completed design with renewables placement and well-studied orientation of the building and circulation. Our design was based on a grid system that allowed the placement of modules on different levels and in different scales to meet any given location requirements, affirming the design scalability and adaptability. Our project utilized medium-sized design with 28 units. This is the school master plan that shows color-coded spaces and circulation within the building. Daylight analysis determined the optimal orientation of the building, the shading structure, as well as the window placement to enhance natural lighting. Our building will provide all the necessities for the children, including a clinic, workshop, library, labs, canteen, recreational space, as well as a greenhouse that will help to provide food for the students and empower them to learn how to plant crops and provide for their communities. There is a diversity in the internal arrangement of the classrooms, which take into account the different age groups of children. Based on that, earthy colors were chosen as they have positive impact on children, giving them a sense of belonging to the place. The school does not only aim to encourage the education of young children, it also aims to empower locals and provide them with various opportunities through the spaces provided within the design, which will be accessible after school hours. We based our color decision on psychology studies to create a de the desired atmosphere in each unit. The external color system will also be used for wayfindings by the students. The site plan emphasizes the use of solids and voids to create a dynamic environment. It also displays a clear understanding of limited external accessibility. Native low maintenance plants were chosen for the landscape to allow ch children to be fully engaged with all of their senses, enhancing their learning experience. 
PET plastic bottles filled with sand are used in the module's interior and exterior walls to provide thermal insulation, reducing waste, and create durable earthquake-resistant structure. The community can also participate by filling and stacking the bottles, creating a connection to the school they, they help build. We will use available materials and local resources in each camp, which will help keep cost low and utilize known building techniques. This further shows the modules element and the stack effect ventilation, which improves the indoor air quality and significantly reduce the energy demand of the building. This shows the U value of the building elements, further proving their efficient use as building envelope components. Our zero energy schools utilize natural ventilation, highly efficient building envelope, excellent day lighting, efficient heating and cooling split units, LED lighting, and renewable energy sources to exceed energy demand. Minimizing plug, heating, and cooling loads during non-operational hours reduce consumption, resulting in a highly sustainable design. Our innovative design resulted in around 15% less than baseline total site UI for the building, demonstrating the effectiveness of our approach in creating sustainable and energy efficient structures. Various renewable energy sources were utilized to achieve net zero energy through vaults, multiple wind walls, Archimedes screw turbines, the use of PV cells on roofs and canopies, and dome-shaped Fresnel lens on top of each unit. The dome-shaped Fresnel lens has dual functionality by allowing for stack effect ventilation when raised, as well as concentrating sunlight to produce solar energy. For situations of harsh temperatures, the dome can be closed remotely using an actuating motor. These are the production values for each renewable technology implemented in each camp in kilowatt hours per year, as well as the tons of CO2 saved per year. With the excess energy generated, we are able to provide power to the surrounding shelters in the area. These areas face water scarcity and have limited access to safe drinking water. This project plans to collect rainwater, treat it for reuse, and reduce water consumption from other sources by implementing innovative water management strategies. Water usage will be closely monitored to ensure that it remains within sustainable limits, while additional water will be sourced from local authorities if required. The water system diagram of this design involves rainwater collection from the roofs, filtration and treatment, storage in underground tanks, and distribution through a closed loop system for multiple uses. The building design is comprised of three components, namely the construction cost, the building envelope materials cost in the implementation of energy efficient technologies with goal of creating quality, education enabling spaces, minimizing environmental impact and operational costs. The Eagle's Nest app will help account for the safety of all the kids in the school. This will be a catalyst for attendance and provide a sense of security for the children and parents, renewable monitoring for efficiency, and monitoring the buildings for climate control. These are progressions and improvements that we would like to make moving forward. In conclusion, the challenges faced by refugees in camps like these highlight the urgent need for projects like ours to provide access to basic needs and support for displaced individuals. Through the construction of zero energy schools that incorporate sustainable architecture, we can empower communities to build a better future for themselves and their children. It is only through collective action and partnerships that we can work towards establishing security, empowerment, and opportunity for all. Thank you. Thank you so much for such an excellent presentation. Uh, we'll go into Q&A here. Uh, Patricia, if you want to start. Sure. Uh, I think it's very interesting. Um, we have three school or three locations. So with that, what um, specific climate differences of those three locations does your design um, respond to? How does it, um, yeah, how does it know where, at what point in the process are you building in the specific requirements of the climate? Um, so that it comes into the, that where the modularity of our design comes into play. So that's why we modeled three different uh, climate areas for our design. So we had the, in Pugnito, it is uh, dry and uh, flat. In the Jordan climate, it's a little bit more like where we're at right now in Texas, where it's a little bit more humid, but still flat. And then also we had the Cox Bazaar camp, which was very rugged terrain, a lot of uh, bumps in the area. So that, that shows that our design can be modeled anywhere where we can have space for it. Uh, does that answer the question? A little bit. So you're saying um, the components it's more about having pieces that can be flexible mm -hmm. rather than the pieces responding or doing something different in each location. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So for if a 
school is going to be deployed in an area, then during the planning phase for that school, that's where the modularity would help kick in. And then if something needs to be changed, it can be changed during the design phase. Okay. And this one's about security. So I saw the technical side of the security planning. What, or I guess this might be answered in the last question, but how does um, the modularity allow itself to um, provide like physical security or like um, a design security rather than an observing security? Um, is on. So uh, the modularity uh, provides like, it's like a Lego basically. Uh, so you have these pieces, you can uh, organize them in any way, shape or form that you desire. Uh, so uh, when we have modules uh, stacked uh, like beside each other, uh, all forming like a border by themselves to in, in, um, to, in uh, to make a, it form an enclosed space uh, that, uh, is inviting is and secure for the kids to uh, go in and uh, uh, like go on with their education. And yeah, does that answer your question? Right. I, I think I heard you create a border with the, yeah with the, the same modules themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Catherine, questions. Catherine, you're on mute, Catherine. Thank you so much. Um, would you guys zoom all the way to the end? Let's look at your timeline for completion. And then I, I guess that was just so quick. I wanted to see what you felt like you still needed to complete um, in order for this to be ready. Um. So as you can see here, we mentioned out several things, but of course we always want to. Reevaluate our energy modeling and all of our renewables. But then as far as uh, the architectural part, I'll let um, our Jordan team talk about that a little bit. So uh, for the architectural part, uh, we're gonna uh, further develop and make sure that all, all the technicalities uh, from our part are met or uh, are refined as best as we can. As we can. Uh, like what maybe enhance the elevations, um, maybe produce also better renderings, also um, uh, make sure that the window placements are ideal. Uh, we have uh, attempted to make them uh, ideal, but we want to make sure uh, that they are 100% the ideal placement and uh, the passive strategies, make sure that we take every box uh, of the list that, um, that uh, makes passive strategies, uh, like it enhances like load minimization, uh, the orientation is the ideal orientation and so on and so forth. Okay, two very quick questions, very, very quick. Has the local team engaged uh, to find out what local building codes might be impacting the construction? And then your cost slide listed the cost, is that a cost by pod? And are you seeing consistent cost across all three locations? Um, I'll answer the cost part real quick. The cost is for um, a building, the unit that we were talking about here, the 28, um, the 28 unit uh, structure for at each different site. Uh, and then we didn't cost it out by pod, but we it is a little bit different uh, per square foot in each site. We are at time, unfortunately. I'm sorry to cut you off there. But we are at time. So um, thank you for an excellent presentation. I uh, appreciate all the teams coming on today. So um, our next uh, presenter will be the Cooper Union for Advancement of Science and Art. Uh, if that team will bring their slides up and we can do a quick audio check while uh, the jurors switch over to the next project. Hello, check one, two, check one, two. Yep, we well, can hear you. Thank you. And your sides are looking good. So we'll give the jurors just a minute or two here to um, switch to your project. And thank you again to the University of North Texas for their 
excellent presentation. Catherine and Patricia, are you both ready? Ready. Thumbs up, okay. Uh, Cooper Union for Advancement of Science and Art, your team is ready to go. Please go ahead. You have eight minutes to present. Hello everyone, we are the Cooper Union Solar Decathlon team and we present to you the expansion of the Harbor School on New York City's Governor's Island, a project announced in August by the New York City's Mayor's Office. The Harbor School is a public high school accessible only by ferry that specializes in a maritime focused and environmentally conscious education, supported by its proximity to both the Hudson River and the East River. The school offers underprivileged students career training in marine research, such as oyster restoration, vessel operations, and professional diving. We met with the principal to understand their needs and learned that the school has outgrown their current facilities and lacks a pool and a gym. Our team has designed a new academic building with classrooms, labs, workshops, a gym, and a pool, and proposed renovations for existing building 555, creating a net zero Harbor School campus that is comfortable, affordable, sustainable, and spotlights the Harbor. The project is located on the northwest shore of Governor's Island. On the left are images from a site visit showing the existing school building 550 and the vacant building 555. The drawing on the right shows the future location of the new academic building on the adjacent triangular lot. Our urban strategy was to replace the worn out roads with public space to enhance the campus unity and pedestrian access. In this aerial image, we can see the newly connected campus informed by our five main design guiding concepts. We create new community space through sculpted landscape and public volumes. We also enhance the circulation and access within the campus and to the rest of the island using an elevated boardwalk as well as a pier adjacent to the campus for access to water. We carefully consider flood angles uh, at flood levels and sun angles through designing in section. And lastly, we abide by the historical preservation codes. This overall campus plan on the left shows the classrooms in the renovated building 555 and the new academic building with the new boardwalk connecting the three buildings. The public space of the boardwalk extends into the new academic building to connect to a promenade that takes you to a flexible gathering area that doubles as informal learning space. The classrooms are accessible from this space and the pool and gym are placed on the south corner to allow for maximum solar gain. This exploded isometric diagram shows the distribution of new programs. The pool and gym are stacked on top of each other on the left and on the right are the classrooms. We are proposing a green roof that provides the roof garden program and serves as an insulator for the classrooms below. We use Climate Studio to project a site EUI of 19 K KBTU per square foot. And the pool is the largest consumer of energy, taking up half of the energy use, followed by the gym, classrooms, and labs. For the landscape, our design includes a cut and fill strategy where the excavation debris from the new academic building is used to fill the basement of building 555, which currently floods and is unusable. Our distribution of programs acknowledges the design flood elevation, securing essential programs such as classrooms by raising the building 10 feet off the ground. Solar panels are only allowed on the new academic building as building 555 is a historical landmark building. We use the software Rhino with the Climate Studio extension to determine the optimal 40 degree tilt angle. The annual direct solar radiation is 350 kBTU per feet square, and the 22% efficient sun powered solar panels produce around 2.8 million kBTU a year, making our building a net zero energy building with a net source UI of negative 12 kBTU per square feet. The excess energy production will go into a battery pack system for grid failure events or be sold back to the grid. The skylights illuminate the gym with indirect daylight and apertures provide daylight to the green roof and outdoor spaces. The roof collects rainwater that feeds into storage tanks to supply non-potable water for toilet and irrigation. The MEP schemes integrate architectural design from the roof canopy system to the foundation, reducing space requirements for return ducts. Energy piles combine heat exchange loops with the foundation structure and the shallow sinky coils in the ground slabs and under the pool excavation use the ground as a heat sink and source and are tied with a geothermal heat pump. The dedicated outdoor air systems or DOAS uses heat recovery wheels for latent and sensible heat recovery and coils tied to the geothermal heat pump system. 
In the summer and winter, the optimal outside air that balances energy monitors uh, is able to provide the necessary air changes for increasing student and teacher cognition and productivity, which is supplied via the DOAS. Radiant panels cool or heat the room and air cascades to the common space through acoustically protected transfer vents. The decoupled zone cooling and heating uses hydronic radiant panels or floors. In the summer, the canopy roof blocks direct solar radiation from entering the classrooms to minimize solar gains, and the green roof also provides evaporative cooling. In the winter, the solar radiation adds passive gains to the space by the south-facing exposures. To keep the embodied energy low, the primary structure is constructed from mass timber, keeping the transportation costs low through the selection of local material manufacturers and using inert construction debris to fill the unusable seller level of building 555 further offsets our transportation costs. Additionally, excess electricity generated by the photovoltaic panels is projected to offset the entire project's embodied carbon in 10 to 12 years. The new academic building features a moment frame truss hybrid roof system that is supported by a lightweight CLT superstructure that carries gravity and lateral loadings to deep pile foundations below, creating a resilient and serviceable structural system. This is a view of the promenade. In front, the boardwalk connects to the hybrid staircase that goes from the ground floor to classrooms and also leads up to the roof garden. We can also see the canopy creating a pe pleasant public space underneath for students, as well as a spatial definition for the new campus. In the west facade, we are selective in the window placement and glazing for protected northwest sunlight to classrooms. Now we talk about existing building 555. The future flexibility envisions removing partitions, enlarging corridors and stairwells as seen by the plan views before and after. The retrofit of building 555 includes radiant ceiling panels on the first floor for resiliency and in slabs on the second and third floors. The mechanical equipment is on the third floor. A solar chimney modifies an existing one, adding passive heating and cooling to the space. Mineral wool insulation is used for its effectiveness, resilience, and soundproofing qualities in renovating this old building. For structural cases, the existing gravity system is reinforced vertically with a retrofitted steel braced frame that acts as the building's new lateral resisting system, and the new imposed loads by this system are carried down to the cellar, which is now filled, which acts as ballast, improving the overall structural resilience and longevity. We now thank you, the jurors, the Solar Decathlon organizers, the Harbor School, and our industry partners. We would now like to open the floor for any questions. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much for a great presentation. Uh, Catherine, do you want to kick us off this time? Yes, thank you. Okay, let me preface this by saying keep your answers super short because I have a couple of questions. I saw that you had the 100-year float plane noted. Um, was there any looking at the 500-year flood plane? Uh, I'll the take I'll take that question. <clears throat> so the uh, current 100-year uh, floodplain uh, was designed with ASCE 1619, and then the local, the current New York City FEMA maps that we that are being referenced. Uh, the 500-year flood map was taken a look at, and it does go right below the beginnings of the second story for both buildings. Okay. Has ha, when was the last time that map was updated? Is uh, it current? Uh, I believe the current one that I'm using is the FEMA 2014 to my, if that's the correct knowledge, that's New York City Building Code is referencing. Perfect. Um, in building 555, what's the floor to ceiling height on the second floor? Uh, architecture, I think you guys can take that if you remember. Uh, the floor to ceiling height is around 12 feet. Okay. And then, so you're going to... Um, pour in a new kind of floating slab for the radiant? Uh, yes, a thin uh, thin two inch slab will be used to have PEX tubing below for the radiant uh, pan. Either If it's on the ceiling, it'll be radiant panels, which are mounted mechanically. If it's uh, the radiant tubing, it'll be cast in a lightweight grout of two inches thick. Okay, great. Last question. Have you pulled the lithology logs for the site for your geothermal system? And do you know 
if you're doing how many feet on center for your vertical bore field? I, I can answer the question with the pile spacing because it corrected uh, corresponded with the structural. Uh, the yes. pile caps are uh, will have between four and six piles each, and those pile caps are spaced for the new academic building 20 feet on center. I will now throw it to Ms. for the geothermal. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by the lithography graph. Yeah, it's it's the perform. I'm going to stop because I'm going to I'm going to throw this to Patricia. Thank you though for the structural answer. Thanks, Catherine. Um, did you face any design challenges with the requirements of historic preservation in this building? Uh, in terms of building five five five. Uh, we weren't really allowed to change any of the facade elevations or add anything to the roof. And so most of our design concepts went into the interior and the kind of relaying out of the classroom spaces within the volume. Okay. Um, what is the, the kind of relationship between the buildings and the water's edge? Uh, the history of the school is that they are active in diving and all these things, but do they, and the marine side, so what has been designed for that interaction? So I can answer that question. So uh, we are planning to also generate a pier adjacent to our campus, which is shown in this image. And this will serve as the a school's access to like a sailing course or sailing class, also uh, diving or anything related to the river that we are uh, able to use. So I think our just generation of the peer was our uh, access uh, answer to that uh, question. And we also create um, classrooms that are facing the water, which didn't exist before. And we also uh, create new spaces for boat storage for uh, water retention and uh, greater connection to the actual site. Okay. I don't know if there's minutes left, but would you say that's the next step? Because I don't, I'm not sure um, if you shared what the next steps after this. If there's a slide that we could go back to. Uh, which slide? Uh, next steps. So what comes after this? Next steps. Uh, I don't recall that we would have a next steps, but overall from the, the team's perspective, it's to can, uh, improve the resolution uh, of the internal program for the architectural uh, to do uh, secondary and more uh, in-depth design of structural connections. And for MEP, it will be to integrate all of the secondary uh, mechanical systems that might be involved, such as different types of heating that we didn't account for in our original model to improve the accuracy of our overall system. Okay. And essentially, energy modeling, another iteration, is the next step, really, right? It's a whole iterative process, and we're just trying to improve our resolution. Thank you so much for your questions. And with that, we are at time. Thank you very much, Cooper Union for Advancement of Science and Arts. This was an excellent presentation. Um, also, kudos to having matching backgrounds for everybody. It's uh, <laughs> Very nice to make sure that we're all on the same team and see you all there together. So thank you for that. Uh, our next presenter is going to be Howard University. Great, we can see your slides, and while the jurors are switching over to your project, uh, if you want to do a sound check real quick. Can everyone hear me? Yes, yeah. we can. Yes, we can. Thank you. We'll give the jurors another minute here. Catherine and Patricia, are you ready? Thumbs up, thumbs up, great. Howard University, please take it away. Thank you. Hello, we are Team Revive, and this is our educational retrofit of the Mertiller Minor Building on Howard's campus. 
This is an overview of our interdisciplinary team. We are made up of architecture majors, environmental science majors, as well as engineering majors. Getting into the history of our building, um, Martilla Minor, for whom the building and associated schools were, uh, were named, founded the first ever um, normal school for black girls in the District of Columbia. She was an abolitionist who founded this school in 1851, which was during a time where slavery was still prevalent in America and it was illegal for black people to learn how to read and write. Martilla Minor understood that education was a form of abolition as it would allow black and brown people to self-liberate. After her passing, Martilla Minor passed down the school to Emily, fellow abolitionist Emily Howland. And in 1913, the Martilla Minor Hall that we know today was constructed and the normal school became M Minor College of Education. In 1929, this school was uh, responsible for producing DC's foremost black educators. And it continued in that legacy in from 1930 through 1980 as it served as the Howard University College of Education. This is an overview of our goals. Our overarching goal is to revive the building through net zero energy standards and decarbonization. We're doing this on three fronts. One, by reclaiming the historical spaces that have been lost and reestablishing the legacy of black education. Two, by renewing the vitality of the building in a way that is sustainable and resilient through those net zero standards. And then three, by enriching the education of the black minds who will be educated here. After reviewing the history highlighted on how rich in African-American history Washington, D.C. is, we've selected D.C. for our redevelopment based on its historical significance. The minor building that we're reviving is to the right of Georgia Avenue, which is denoted in red, that is not only immersed in African-American culture, but Howard culture as well, that has migrated into the surrounding neighborhoods. This slide illustrates the rich resources surrounding the minor building that the previous slide begins to detail, which also helps to highlight Howard Middle School's proximity to the minor building and Howard's campus. Looking at the large 70,000 square foot footprint of the historic minor building, we will reclaim and revive 50,000 square foot of the building in phase one, which will be the, these three main floors to house the Howard Middle School, which has a science and math curriculum. Since the school currently serves 300 students, this building upgrade will assist in the development of the middle school and foster the expansion of the student body in continuing to enrich the young bright leaders. The historic minor building has been underperforming for a while now and deserves to be occupied. Currently, this beautiful colonial revival building acts as lost space and is in dire need of a revive and reclaiming the beautiful facade and renewing the historical teaching of the historical teaching spaces to educate our future leaders is a goal of ours. So these are the proposed floor plans. Um, we have the traditional gym and cafeteria areas, but the multiple mental health spaces is what makes this building unique. In keeping with our goals, these spaces will enrich the students through providing a calming atmosphere, allowing them to decompress. To address the well-being of the occupant, we wanted to create mental health spaces specifically for students. Um, these spaces will have greenery and plans to help reduce levels of stress, as well as soundproof walls. The classrooms will include flexible furniture and collaboration spaces for students and teachers to have a positive experience. To provide a healthy, comfortable environmental quality, the classrooms facing southeast will utilize natural light. Adjustable aluminum LEDs will be used for visual comfort, and there will also be sound dampening wall paneling and ceiling tiling. These design decisions have allowed us to align with our goal to renew the building by making it zero carbon. The distinct E-shaped form of the building shows how it was built to maximize the levels of daylight, so it's a perfect building to integrate performance as it was already started with performance in mind. With the minus building natural solar exposure and orientation, our ability to produce energy and light spaces within the building naturally is enhanced. As a result, we are able to move closer towards a building of reclaiming an iconic building and making it a net zero building. We are going to use this building built in 1913 to renew the life of the building for over 100 years for an increase in durability and resiliency. The site slopes toward the Georgia Avenue side, so we're utilizing that for rainwater harvesting and to embrace the surrounding neighborhoods to strengthen the relationships previously developed. 
In keeping with our goal of creating a net zero building, we have decided to use high efficiency uh, heat and cooling delivery systems in the way of ground source heat pumps, which are diagrammed in their delivery. In addition to the existing facades, we will be adding these materials to up our R values and increase the integrity of our envelope, further reducing our heating and cooling loads. For energy production, we are limited as to where we can place photovoltaics because this is a historical retrofit, but we have strategically placed uh, areas for photovoltaics on our roof where they will not compromise the uh, existing facades. And in addition to that, we will be sourcing from local renewable energy uh, production on our campus. An important part of reviving the minor building is the embodied environmental impact and reducing our carbon footprint. By retrofitting the minor building, instead of constructing a new building, we are maximizing our carbon emission reductions and moving forward to be completely decarbonized. Lastly, for the minor building, we had three goals that we wanted to meet for the project. Firstly, we wanted to meet energy demands. We did this by reducing and controlling energy demands and introducing green building techniques that will ultimately lead us to our goal of net zero. Secondly, we wanted to revive the minor building. We did this by revitalizing the existing building and then modernizing the interior. And lastly, we wanted to provide safe spaces. We did this by building safe spaces for, for mental health and incorporating green spaces to generate calming environments. In conclusion, we'd like to wrap up just by highlighting again why we chose this building. The Matilla Minor Building on Howard's campus is, not, is historically significant, not only to our campus and our school, but also to Black history as a whole. It represents a legacy of Black education and self-liberation um, that have allowed us to further ourselves to where we are today. Reviving this building and perpetuating the legacy that it represents is a key goal and the main reason why we selected this building for retrofit. Looking forward, we will continue to work with our industry partners to deepen our analysis of our energy performance as well as our decarbonization. Um, for architecture, occupant experience and comfort and quality, we will continue to program the spaces uh, of, on our floor plans and take a deeper look at common areas um, and the placement of mental health spaces. Thank you for your time and uh, we look forward to hearing your questions. Thank you for an excellent presentation. Uh, Patricia, do you wanna kick us off this time with your Q&A? Sure. Uh, tell us more about the accessibility challenges with this uh, building. I, I am assuming that there's a lot of historic preservation involved and a lot of requirements to keeping the building as it is. Thank you for that question. Uh, one of the main things we're looking at as far as accessibility is where the main approach of the building should be. It currently fronts uh, Georgia Avenue, which is where the front uh, facade of the building is, um, but due to the stairs that are there, it's not very accessible, uh, which is why we are planning to implement a just as um, key uh, kind of like front uh, on the 6th Avenue side where that slope does not exist and uh, all students are able to approach. Okay, and uh, with using the existing building, are you keeping all of it? Are you keeping a shell? Is there a diagram that shows exactly what's being renovated or removed or replaced? We're currently working on an exact diagram to show all the pieces that we will be keeping, but um, in short, we'll be keeping all of the exterior cladding as well as um, the interior structure. Um, for the wall assemblies and roof assemblies, uh, much of it was compromised due to water infiltration, so that will be removed um, and uh, large repairs to the structure will be made, um, but we felt it would be more in line with our decarbonization goals to keep as much as possible. Okay, um, I'm, I'm going to squeeze in one more question. Uh, with the existing structure, um, did, it, did you have challenges with um, sustainable design, for example, being able to have enough panels. Um, I saw a roof plan, so did that limit the amount of panels that you could have on the building? Yes, so because we are limited in how much we can obscure the facades, um, what we do on the roof plays into that. There are some flat areas on our roof that we are able to use for photo 
photovoltaics. Um, but because there are so many um, solar energy sources immediately near our site, um, we are able to tap into those um, as part of the greater connection of the campus as we, because uh, the campus is moving toward a net zero standard. So we'll just tap into the energies that's being produced around. Okay, Catherine. Great, thank you. Well, first of all, um, I saw this building about six months ago. So this was a very interesting presentation for me. Um, like three very quick hitter questions, so keep it short. Um, I noticed you had a picture of a horizontal loop field when talking about your geothermal system. Does this site actually have a capacity for horizontal or are you actually looking at vertical bore field? We're currently, we're currently exploring all the possibilities for that, um, but we will look deeper into the, the vertical as opposed to the horizontal. Yeah, um, and I didn't hear anything about windows, but, and if, and if I remember right, when I walked by it, could you go over the windows again? Because I think there's a lot of, of replacement necessary on windows and how you're going to tie that into the historic nature of it. What are you gonna do with windows? So the current windows are double pane, um, which is going to be our selection. We plan to repair um, most of the windows that are there. Um, and for any that can't be replaced or repaired, we will, re we will replace them with a uh, new double pane glass. Okay, great, thank you. And have you started to explore cost? Yes, we have. I'll leave that to Cameron Mack, our uh, mark analysis. Okay. Hi, uh, that would be me. Um, the proposed budget for the building is around $26 million with an average cost per square foot ranging to $350 per square feet. Oh, gotcha. Okay, yes, I see that now in your summary. Thank you. Um, and then last question, how does this fit in with the new campus master plan? Have you talked with the university itself about implementing this? particular uh, project? Yes, so one of our energy partners, uh, Canon Design, they are responsible for the current renovation of minor that is uh, that is just broken ground actually like about a month ago. Um, and they uh, we've been collaborating with them about kind of integrating new energy standards for the building um, and which is in line with the uh, campus's current goal of becoming net zero. Great. And I don't see the time's up slide, so I'm going to squeeze in one more. Is any part if this building is it currently uh, connected to the power plant, and will that be a source of redundant uh, energy, either thermal or electric? Currently, the building is connected to the power plant, um, but the goal of the university is to reduce the connections to that uh, thermal heating that is happening because it was was responsible for some. Uh, some destruction that happened a few years ago. Um, a few buildings were destroyed. Um, um, so they're reducing the connection to the geothermal. Oh, I'm sorry. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Sorry to cut you off, but um, thank you for the excellent responses to the questions and for your great presentation. Uh, we are going to take a few minute break here. Um, it is currently 11.06. Eastern time, and we will be rejoining at 1120. So thank you, everyone. And we'll see you in just a few minutes here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, welcome back, everyone. Uh, our next presenter is going to be Mississippi State University. If you want to start bringing your slides up and bringing your team onto their cameras. All righty. Can you all see them? Yes, we can see your slides. All right, cool. And uh, Patricia and Catherine, are you two ready to get started? Yes, sir. Okay, I think, uh, yeah, Mississippi State University, please go ahead. All right. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. We are the Mississippi State University Solar Dogs, and this is our project, Magnolia High. 
My name is Colton Barr. I'm the student project manager for the team. I'm accompanied by Jackson Lampkin, the engineering team lead, and Ellie Mason, our architecture team lead. <clears throat> now, Magnolia High has been designed to be built in Jackson, Mississippi, where a new school has actually not been built since the 1960s. The existing schools are underfunded, and the city is dealing with one of the worst water crises in American history. Magnolia High will be built on top of the pre-existing school, Wingfield High School. Their current building at Wingfield seems to be unable to accommodate the number of students they have. In addition, their sports facilities are a rundown and practically unusable despite having a successful athletics department. Now, when designing Magnolia High, we are gonna look at six key objectives. We will have an off-grid water system to limit and or treat the water coming in from the city. Magnolia High will incorporate different architectural components to provide privacy and safety. Automated safety systems will be throughout the school to help limit the threat of intruders. Green spaces will be designed to help promote healthy mental well-being and creativity. Collaborative work areas will also be used to encourage creativity as well as teamwork. Uh, and VOTEC classrooms will be implemented to help prepare students for success after graduation. Finally, our school will give everyone an equal opportunity to succeed. There will be classrooms to accommodate any special needs students, and there will be a daycare incorporated with the VOTEC classrooms. This will allow teen parents to drop off their children at daycare and continue going to class rather than drop out. Magnolia High looks to create a healthy educational environment for the underdeveloped schools and 90 to 93% of students not meeting the state educational standard at Wingfield High. Our school looks to accommodate the predominantly underserved minority local group to the area while also celebrating diversity. Now Magnolia High is located in the humid subtropical zone 3A. Our average annual rainfall is higher than most states, allowing our off-grid water system to function fairly well. The conditions also allow for multiple passive building strategies, such as cross ventilation, daylighting, wind towers, or a louvered panel system. Magnolia High will be designed to comply with all local building codes and regulations. The most relevant codes to our project will be those outlined for universal accessibility and mass timber construction. An important architectural feature of the design is the organization of outdoor spaces. All the, at the ground level, students will have access to private and secure landscaped areas. And then the roof will hold a variety of distinct spaces, including a solar panel array, rainwater collection system, and occupiable rooftops. The massing of Magnolia High was designed to com combine sustainability and safe school design. This led us to a centralized design that allows for not only stack ventilation, but direct visibility to all circulation spaces, creating an eyes on the street effect within the school. We also designed a lobby area off of this space with two distinct entries, one of these for students and the other for visitors. Both of these entries can easily be monitored from one location. In addition, we will design a screen system to envelope the entire structure. This will offer security and privacy to the occupants of the building while creating a framework for exterior green walls. This system can also be parametrically designed in specific areas to, allow, to control the amount of daylight that enters the building. Schools in the U.S. produce 530,000 tons of food waste annually, and we plan to implement an anaerobic digester to help combat this issue. The system would be used to harness biogas that could provide energy to the building and convert the excess food waste into fertilizer that could be used for green spaces, gardens, and possibly surrounding areas in the community. In turn, this would allow us to reduce the strain on the waste management system and provide recyclable energy into our design. As school safety has become an increasingly severe problem in our nation, we plan to equip our design with a security automation system that will allow our students, faculty, and staff to be safe from outside intruders as well as mitigating an internal emergency. With safety and security in mind, upper faculty and security staff will be able to monitor, control, and survey all entry points and hallways into the school with this system. Now to create a more resilient entity, our design plans to implement a green roof water rain, rainwater catchment system for gray water use, as well as a UV light filtration system to decontaminate the local water supply in the case of a citywide water boil notice. These two will be mutually exclusive and will help combat the infrastructural issues local to the area. Materials have been carefully selected to ensure sustainable practices such as 
carbon footprint and recyclability, as well as considering economic and structural choices within the design. In addition, these materials will be locally sourced within the southeastern area relative to Jackson to reduce carbon footprint as well as material transportation costs. Passive elements such as stack and cross ventilation have been implemented into the architecture of the building to reduce the load on active systems as well as improve occupant experience. With the use of centralized composition, our design will allow for us to exhaust unwanted heat through operable skylights as well as harnessing, harnessing fresh air to naturally ventilate the space. With this in mind, we plan to also integrate a paired VRF air handling unit that can provide heating, cooling, and free cooling capabilities, as well as ventilated air to all condition environments. This unique system will allow an increased energy savings year round, as well as in a sufficient comfort for the occupant. In terms of occupant experience, we wanna ensure that all spaces receive adequate natural light. For rooms that are not positioned for direct daylighting, we'll use techniques such as light ducts or clear stories. In addition to creating ample natural light within the school, we would also like to ensure that students have access to safe and exciting outdoor areas throughout their day. These would include organic gardens that allow students to grow their own produce or outdoor classrooms, lounging areas, and athletic facilities. The city of Jackson lies in a region of moderately high sun exposure and solar radiation. With the implementation of rooftop PV arrays, the building will generate enough electricity to reach net zero standards annually. We have now finalized our partnership with Perkins and Will Dallas and will soon be finishing conceptual design. We will then transition to schematic and begin producing the necessary drawings that define the space. Next, we will assemble a set of diagrams and renderings that fully illustrate our ideas. Finally, we'll complete a physical model while preparing for the final presentation. Thank you all for joining us today to discuss our design and we will now be accepting any questions. Thank you everyone. Thanks for an excellent presentation. Uh, Patricia, do you wanna go first for your questions? Sure. Oh, you went back on mute. <laughs> I hit the space bar. Could you go to um, a slide that um, shows the floor plan or a, a, a basic floor plan um, and talk about how... This one? Yeah, okay. So what are the, um, the <clears throat> goals for the school building as far as it... As far as the users, something unique to the users. Well, I would say we plan on designing the, the actual structure into clusters that allow for each cluster to have its own um, energy within the space. So we'll have a like math cluster, science cluster, art cluster, uh, a botech cluster that allows students to kind of have all of these different experiences throughout the day and change their perspective on the school. So it's not so monotonous, um, a continuous design. It's it's more um intriguing and exciting in my opinion okay and this shows an existing school full footprint and the plan would be to um what is the plan to yes, remove the, it to yeah yes the plan would be to remove it and also we're going to be refurbishing the athletic facilities to bring them up to date you can see the pictures there at the bottom uh, they're very run down um, you really can't even see them on Google Maps. Uh, so we'll be redoing the school since it was built in the 30s and it's just really not very salvageable in our opinion. Um, and then we'll be refurbishing athletic facilities is the plan. Mm -hmm. And lastly, um, the site, what's the kind of soil condition there? Um, is it dry? Is it wet? Um, what's your what's the feasibility of a school that is tall or that is very wide going on there? Um, we'd like to do something that's wider. In Mississippi, we have a lot of um, clay. It's a bit of a more moist soil than it is in other areas in the States. Um, so that's kind of better for a lower type of construction. It's not as, um, as structurally sound as some other soil types, but. Okay, thank you, Catherine. Okay, um, let's talk about climate zone for just a second. This is 3A and you have humidity to deal with, but your passive strategy has a displacement ventilation. Um, 
how are those going to work when some of those strategies could be at cross purposes? Um, have you looked at uh, laying out um, a full a full year and your energy consumption when school is in session versus when school is not in session and how those active and passive strategies are gonna interact in a humid climate? Um, I definitely think as far as the active systems, we will require um, a little bit no more on the active side in terms of being able to condition the air um, properly to dehumidify, dehumidify the area. Um, but as far as taking kind of the design that we were looking at and um, uh, the design that we plan to have, uh, we should be able to efficiently um, still reach net zero standards annually um, while being able to sufficiently condition the environment. Okay, and um, I saw water filtration um, on this, which is which, which is good. I'm glad you included that, which would also lead me to believe that you're thinking about this um, school building potentially being used by the community during a climate event. Have you looked at that and how has that impacted the floor plan and zoning of different areas where community could use this during a climate event? Yes, we'll have large gathering spaces that are meant to be resilient towards not only um, in the case of some kind of uh, emergency where there's a water crisis, but also we have a lot of hurricanes and tornadoes in our area. So somewhere that the community can come and gather, we're thinking either the gym or the auditorium will be making um, extremely structurally sound so that people can gather there in case of an emergency. And if I can add to that, um, Ellie mentioned tornadoes in, in our area. Those are very prominent and we plan to use a lot of mass timber or CLT panels throughout our building, therefore allowing for multiple tornado shelter area types in the building, providing more safety and durability. And then finally, on your anaerobic digester, have you done any calculations yet on uh, the potential thermal capacity that the biogas would be able to provide? And no, we have not yet. Okay. And with that, we are and, out of time. Uh, can I just add so, one more thing about the anaerobic digester? It does largely depend sorry, on the Sorry, we are out of time. Sorry. Sorry to cut you off, but we are out of time. And That's okay. To the other team. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you for your excellent presentation. And uh, at this point, we have another break until our final uh, team starts. And we will meet at 11.50 Eastern Standard Time to start with Northwestern University. So thank you again, Mississippi State University. We appreciate an excellent presentation. Thank you all. Hello, everyone. Uh, we'll be getting started coming back from break in about two minutes here. If the Northwestern team is online, uh, please pull up your slides and we'll get ready. Excellent, we can see your slides. And if you guys want to do a quick audio check. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Let me know when you guys are ready for us to present. Okay, we'll give it uh, one more minute for everybody to come back from break and then we'll we'll get started. Okay. Okay, uh, Catherine, Patricia, thumbs up if you're ready to go. Awesome. Great. So our next presenters are Northwestern University. Uh, let's go ahead. Hello, we are a team in community from Northwestern. Our team consists of 16 undergrad students. We work closely with our design partners, Perkins and Will. School infrastructure significantly contribute to the education outcome. Therefore, maintaining the high quality of school demand our critical retrofitting. On average in the US, school consumes 336 trillion BT of energy with 81% from fossil fuels and 6% of water usage. 
Uh, with most public school aging and rapid growth of enrollment, many schools are struggling to maintain the required standard for long term. Our site is located in Laos, Illinois, with a climate zone of 5A, characterized by cold winters and hot summer. Laos is home to 400 grade 6 to grade 8 students. It was built in 1956 and continued to be extended throughout the next 20 years. The classroom are difficult for collaborations. The restroom are traditionally gender and are not ADA compliant. There's a lack of outdoor space for interactions. On top of that, there's a lack of thermal barriers contribute to heat loss with limited natural light due to the lack of windows that are outdated and inefficient. Based on our analysis, we characterize into two challenges. One is an outdated learning environment and two is antiquated building operations and design. We hope that our retrofit can serve as a sustainable and feasible prototype for existing public schools in the US by prioritizing the needs of our students and the surrounding community. The goal is to centralize Laos and retrofit the aging and outdated school. Approach one is to cultivate an engaging learning environment through centralizing programs, providing flexible learning opportunities, pro promoting more interaction indoor and outdoor, and developing a more inclusive and accessible space. Approach two is to establish a resilient and sustainable campus through an efficient envelope, HVAC system, green energy and water system. This 110,000 square feet net positive prototype will support our sustainable educational mission. Our first approach in retrofitting this school is to cultivate an engaging learning environment. To achieve this, our concept features an open air pavilion and a floor plan that separates the social and learning spaces while prioritizing collaboration. Opportunities to engage with a larger Lyle community are made possible through outdoor and indoor spaces that are inclusive, accessible, and overarchingly welcoming through the entrance canopy. The, the surrounding site intuitively informs the outdoor activities and spaces surrounding the school with a clear path of how to get in and out of the building. The new floor plan prioritizes interconnectivity. A central corridor connects universally shared spaces like the library, cafeteria, and gym. In the right and left wings, the existing massing was used to create decentralized arts and technology spaces. Nestled between the central corridor and these wings are the classrooms. Before and after images in the following slides illustrate the design and identify our improvements. A canopy identifies the main entrance and provides a visible shelter for student drop-off and pickup. The entrance opens into a spacious internal street at the heart of the school, which connects our centralized programs. These programs, like the library and cafeteria, have been elevated not only by centralizing them, but by subtly dividing the space through strong curved features. This allowed us to improve circulation, open the space up to light, and make them more flexible for teachers and students. Flexible teaching and learning is also expressed in the classroom, where students are no longer confined to a dust space and can instead view the entire room as their learning, as their learning space. The bathrooms, which are redesigned to be accessible to all, regardless of gender identity, also reflect this ethos beyond the walls of the building. Outdoor spaces have been revitalized to invite new possibilities for community events, student socializing, school programs, and alternative teaching. Together, these spaces provide centralized and flexible educational programming, promote indoor and outdoor activities, and develop a more in ex inclusive and accessible space. Our second approach is to establish a resilient and sustainable campus. Our concept highlights stormwater management through the use of bioswales, clean energy through PV and a biogas digester, improving the envelope and reusing the existing brick facade, permeable pavement for the parking lot, and advancing water efficiency. Our climate analysis of the sun angle, prevailing wind, and the temperature and solar gain curves informed our solar panels orientation. Existing R values don't meet the IECC standards, but through our retrofit, we can achieve much higher R values. The updates we propose involve an exterior wall cladding that allows the envelope to be updated without compromising the structural walls, the addition of a radiant floor heating system and insulation making the building airtight and preventing further heat loss, and replacing the current residential grade windows with double pane and low E glazing, which reduce window heat loss by 74%. The monocrystalline silicon PV array achieved net zero with greater efficiency and lifespan. Our iron flow battery storage cycles daily, releasing overproduction and during peak hours without the impact of lithium batteries. A biogas digester uses food waste from the school to produce fertilizer for local parks and 17 kilowatt hours daily, enough to substitute for natural gas in the kitchen. Energy capitalizes on the built basement walls as a heat exchanger more cost effectively than boreholes. Altogether, these technologies meet the heating and cooling needs of buildings in 5A climate zones. Our systems prioritize comfort by decoupling, conditioning, and ventilation. Radiant floor heating keeps occupants warm in large spaces, while VRF delivers personalized control in classrooms and offices. And DOA's units with HEPA air filters ensure consistent indoor air quality for all zones. Iron flow batteries supply essential equipment in emergency situations. Furthermore, 
Operable windows in larger spaces allow for passive cooling in summer months, and biophilic design of common spaces in the library prioritize healthy interactions with nature. Quiet VRF cassettes and radiant floors are effective and acoustically inconspicuous while conditioning the building. Daylighting and occupancy sensors reduce artificial light loads by accounting for new skylights and improved glazing. Replacing fluorescence with LEDs increases efficiency where artificial lighting is needed, while consumption dashboards encourage lifespan net zero operation. Our design reduces water use by 40% with water sense fixture upgrades and added gray water for use while flushing more than half our current water use. Outdoors, a nine foot grade difference and steep drop off along the southern perimeter contribute to flooding in residential properties. Our design proposes a system of bioswales, pervious concrete, and a rain garden to manage stormwater in the surrounding community. Our retrofit plan minimizes the added embodied carbon by maintaining the majority of the existing infrastructure and adding new materials with durability in mind. These efforts result in a low carbon impact reflected by the Carbon Heroes benchmark. As our active energy system greatly reduces the carbon impact, renewable energy eliminates the effective operational energy of the school. Our building retrofits have also greatly reduced the building's EUI, which started at a baseline of 48.6 kilobtus. Replacing the old boilers with ground source heat pumps has reduced heating and cooling loads. Added insulation and window replacements have improved our envelope, and the automated system has reduced lighting and ventilation loads. All this working in harmony, our new building EUI is now less than its less than half of its pre-retrofit value. With the solar system, the building achieves our net positive energy goal, generating 13 extra kilobtus per square foot per year. To be a model for outdated schools across the US, we must ensure our plan is cost effective. It costs 40% less per unit area than a new construction, and with the addition of renewable energy grants, that number could fall more. With the reduced operation and maintenance expenditure we provide through our implementations, the school can reallocate more funds toward improving educational supports. Lastly, our two-phase construction plan will renovate the common areas during the school year and the classrooms over the summer to allow classes to continue uninterrupted. Thank you for listening, and we look forward to hearing your questions. Great. Thank you for that presentation. Uh, we have about five minutes here for Q&A, so um, I'll have Catherine start. Please try to keep your uh, answers as concise as possible so we can get through as many of the jurors' questions, okay? So, Catherine, take it away. Okay. Could you go to your slide where you're talking about your ground source heat pumps? Oh, Poland isn't sharing anymore, I think. Okay, so that you went over that very, very quickly. Yep, you went over that very, very quickly. Um, have tell me a little bit more in your own words about what what this particular system is. Oh, yes, yeah. so Anadrip it uses like the basement walls as like a heat exchanger instead of having to like dig boreholes into the ground. Um, it capitalizes on like the constant um, ground temperature. It's a new technology that they're currently, well, they develop it and they're starting to commercialize it um, in Europe. Okay, and then could you do a floor plan then so we could see the where this would be located in the building? Yeah, it would be located on the exterior um, basement walls um, below the- uh, Around the full, uh, the full building. Uh, not around okay. the full building, around the, uh, the basement walls um, where the mechanical equipment is located. Okay. Yeah. And um, you had a wellness space on your floor plan. Tell me what what um, is in your wellness space, why you labeled it that, and what actual activities take place. Yes, that. Um, the wellness space would be a mixture of like admin, um, like um, sort of overlooking something like the counselor space along with like an open space for students to uh, basically come talk to each other socialize in a, like a more quiet private setting um, that's sort of what the idea was behind it at this point but it's a mixture of both having maybe the counselor and also having the students take um, autonomy over how they want to spend some quiet time okay since um co last question for me patricia um since since covid a lot of attention has been placed upon uh, the zoning and the um, HVAC systems for our nurses suites. So it was interesting that you defined wellness in that way. Is there a nurse suite in, inside of this proposed building? Yes. Okay. Go ahead, Patricia. Thank you. 
Yes, no problem. Um, so since we're here, can you explain if all of the classrooms are getting access to daylight? Uh, yes. So um, <clears throat> the small uh, squares you can see on this floor plan that sort of surround that orange block, that's an outdoor courtyard that we have, uh, an internal courtyard um, that we do not have renderings of at the moment. Um, but <clears throat> essentially, so the classrooms that are on the inside will get sunlight from direct sunlight from that courtyard. And then all the other classrooms are on the exterior, as you can see. So they're all getting sunlight as well. Okay. So that was highlighting the courtyard. Thank you. Uh, and um, what in your designs, um, your sustainable designs, which ones are reacting to the specific climate, to what's unique to your climate? In terms of architecture or are you the meaning... your sustainable design? So, um... yeah, so I think one mm -hmm. of the major things and is going to be the envelope, um, given that the cold climate and the use of like geothermal rather than air source heat pumps, because there are quite a few days inside um, Chicago or not just the Chicago area in Illinois, where ground source heat pumps might not be effective and we'd have to use natural gas boilers, but capitalizing on geothermal, we'll be able to run it year round for heating and cooling using geothermal. Great. Um, is time up yet? We still have another minute-ish for more questions. Sure. Can you talk about um, cost? And I also was kind of interested on about the the outdoor classrooms. So pick one of those, cost or outdoor classrooms. <laughs> uh, I could talk about cost. OK. Do you have specific questions or uh, would you just want to know where the numbers come from? Right. Um, can you elaborate more on the cost? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we got the new construction, um, the baseline values from uh, actually an NREL study on the uh, building construction costs for educational buildings. Um, and our construction costs were approximated mostly by focusing on material costs, labor costs, and uh, on-site construction all of which saw reductions from uh, using our retrofit instead of a new construction. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So oh, back on cost in our last 30 seconds, probably. Um, are you sure that you have apples to apples on those where uh, project soft cost are included in both? So uh, we haven't focused, uh, like we haven't, calculated the like legal fees and soft costs entirely. Um, we figured that that would be a pretty small fraction of the cost, but that's something that we will probably look into uh, in between now and the final. And with that, we are at time. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Northwestern, for your uh, excellent presentation here. Um, I want to make sure this is our last uh, presentation of the day. So thank you, and everyone who did present today and yesterday. Um, please be sure to join our uh, Design Challenge finalist announcements at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And thank you and enjoy the rest of the Solar Decathlon semifinals comp competition event. Enjoy your day, everyone. <laughs>